up punks it's shinobi and this is block digest episode number 199 at block height 604,668 wednesday november 20th so what is cracking today jimmy hello hello so are, are we that... gonna are, are we gonna have an indirect um you know third co-host nowadays uh bringing boxes to the audience's attention? Mm, no, at the moment, I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> but it is that time of year that everything is pitch black for like more than 70% of the day, so that's fun. That's when you hole up and do productive things because everything is cold outside and it sucks. Well, it's not the cold that bothers me. It's more the fact that there's no snow to come with it. It's a good thing because the cold sucks, the snow is worse, and they combine together to make the most horrifying thing in existence. No, no, snow is what makes it worth it. No, snow is wet. It it melts and gets wet, and it's wet. I agree to disagree. You are wrong! Okay, moving on. Um... So, uh, the first thing up today is the unknown fund that we actually got into uh, a little bit in the, the special edition with Ben Wolseley, a group that just threw up a website and is claiming to have $75 million in Bitcoin to donate to startups um, in support of anonymity or privacy projects. And the interesting thing here is they specifically say that they're just anonymous people who met on 4chan. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a bit for one of the, the few theories I have on this. But they are planning on you know, accepting requests for grants, I guess, um, concentrating on privacy enhancing things. Um, cryptocurrency tools, uh, private communications applications, uh, pretty much anything helping support anonymity and privacy in, in the digital world. And, you know, the, the first kind of thing that I, I brought up when it, when it came up with Ben was the potential of this just being stolen money or something and them trying to get tools built to launder it. So, you know, and now it's actually have some time to go into just this like what, what what do you think is really going on here jimmy i mean no doubt this is going to attract attention from law enforcement because they don't want any improvements in privacy so there's basically i don't know three basic scenarios that i see either this fund it, because we don't know who runs it it could be run by people who have Bitcoin and maybe they want to be able to, you know, when they say that they're giving this money to a privacy focused project, maybe they want to be able to then follow that money and see where it goes. But obviously that if the, if the project actually works, that would be ineffectual. So I don't know if that's going to work. Um, they could also be legit and, I don't know, probably law enforcement is still going to try and follow the funds and see, like, they're going to use that as a way to identify critical people who are working on stuff that we need to improve privacy and maybe target them more. I don't know. There's, and then maybe everything is fine and people just get money and Bitcoin and privacy improves and that doesn't happen because law enforcement are not always the smartest people on the block. So you want to you want to hear my new theory uh, that I had while 
imbibing in meme inspiration. Sure. So, a little path down history for, for people not familiar with 4chan. There is a subboard, like the equivalent of a subreddit on, on 4chan, called Biz. And woo is Biz one of the dirtiest, pumpiest, grimiest, scammiest, memeiest shitcoin pumping grounds on the entire internet? Like the they, the 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 whales of Biz are are referred to as the Bizraelis is kind of a, a pun on the, the the Jew memes that run rampant on on 4chan, but um. The, like there's literally nowhere else you can go look to see more shit coins that have been created just for the sole purpose of pumping them and then dumping them like it's fucking like the, the best example bitbean like they, they literally made a, a meme and a little cartoon character and made a fucking cover of a smash mouth song pumping the shit coin and it, it pumped like crazy so my brain is wondering if maybe this is just a bunch of whales who made shit tons of Bitcoin, um, having fun in, in the pumping grounds of biz, um, and now need some way to dispose of that or sell that or use that without tying themselves to what is probably crazily illegal in a shit ton of different jurisdictions. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm I'm j I'm just angling at the, the little context clues to the 4chan mentioning and thinking about shit. And I honestly think that that is the most reasonable explanation as to why four people who met on 4chan have $75 million to invest in anonymity developments. Because, I mean, think about that. It, it's 4chan. Yeah, I could see that. Like, there is no way that any sane person on 4chan met somebody to the degree that they could get involved in something this requiring of personal information. Unless they were doing something like coordinating shitcoin memeing and pumping together constantly. So that level of trust already existed. Well, that would certainly be weird, but I guess we won't find out whether... This fund is, you know, whether it intends to do anything until we see the first uh, dispersal. So I haven't seen any updates about whether they found projects to give money to, so we'll have to wait for that, I guess. Yep. But that, that, is, that is Shinobi's most recent theory, and that's the one I'm sticking to. All right, so... Next up in the world of privacy, um, everybody is is running around screaming Mimblewimble has been broken. Um, and honestly, like the first thing I want to say here is that this was a known issue from day one. So pretty much one of the the nice things about Mimblewimble is really the ability to have cut through transactions. So you can kind of non-interactively just take two separate transactions and like mush them together and, and get something a little more compact that, you know, accomplishes the same monetary transfer. And, you know, this is, this gets real efficient in kind of, you can smash every transaction in a block into a coin join without any kind of security loss. And this was like always thought of as a huge potential privacy improvement. But the issue is um, you have to make those individual transactions before you can combine them. And everybody has been concentrating on just building the combining transactions into how the peer-to-peer -peer transaction relay works on the network. Well, the issue with that is um, if you set up a node or a number of nodes, um, it doesn't really matter which one, and connect to as many uh, nodes on the network as you can, um, you see 
both the compressed transactions and the non-compressed transactions because you're just collecting and saving all the stuff being relayed by all the nodes you connect to. And you know, there you're able to kind of work things backwards to the earliest non-compressed form of these transactions you can and identify the input output mappings. Um, so, and also you, you can't actually identify the amounts involved here, just the input output mappings. But the, the, the real issue is like, there, there's no real way that you can stop this unless you resort to some private centralized coordination of, of effectively coin joins um, with these Mimble Wimble transactions. And the, the, the guy who actually did this, um, Dragonfly Research, uh, was able to get 96% of transactions, um, inputs and outputs mapped and linked, only connecting to 200 of the 3,000 peers on the grid network around the time this was done. So an above 90% success rate connecting to just rel a relatively small fraction of the overall network. And so it, it's really just at the end of it, like Mimblewimble isn't really giving more privacy than you can get on Bitcoin with something like confidential transactions. Like the, the main win in the, the entire model is more the scalability. The fact that you can throw out everything except the headers and a tiny part of transactions and just keep that in the UTXO set and that fully validates the history. You can just bootstrap from that. That's the main advantage of Mimblewimble. Like privacy wise, you can get the, the same or I would argue a better privacy model with the right things implemented on Bitcoin. And so it's it's really just like, you know, here is something that was known from day one being thrown around the ecosystem is a big shock like maybe that's an indicator that you should actually think things through instead of just investing or dealing with things based on the the coolest marketing thoughts criticisms kitty noises i wish i had kitty noises but i do not have any at the moment all right, so I guess we will just slide along into the next one. Uh, so there is an issue with Monero. A big oopsie, a bad one. Dun, dun, dun. The Monero website for at least 30 minutes in... Um, in a 24 hour period, uh, two days ago, was pretty much just tossing out malicious malware instead of the actual uh, Monero binaries. And, you know, there's kind of two lessons, really, I would say to, to take away from this. One, um, when you're downloading binaries like that, you, you need to actually check the, the PGP signatures. You actually need to check that binary hash against what those signatures have signed because all it takes is putting the wrong data in malicious software and there goes your money. And then, you know, another lesson to take away from this is there, there has been a big rush in, in binary downloads uh, for Monero because they have a regularly scheduled hard fork coming up. And if you don't update, you, you don't keep going with the chain. So th there's the other aspect of things like hard forks, things like upgrades that mandate a hard deadline for upgrading your software, you know, that creates the, the opportunity to pull these kinds of, of bad binary attacks because everybody has to get it by then. So you know there's a massive pool of users to, to pull from as far as potential targets instead of the, the, the way things are conservatively done with softworks, people can just upgrade as they're ready. So like, you know, it's really like getting the proper thing distributed to users is hard, but there are definitely things that both users and people distributing those things can do to make things better. 
Like there's there's lessons to learn on both sides there. Does Kitty have a comment? No, but he would like to. I don't know. Nope, he doesn't have a comment. Damn you, Kitty. Well then, Janine, uh, you're up. Alrighty, one second. No, I said you're up. What do you think this is? Public access television news? Well, of course it's not that, because we're we're not we're not getting frantic phone calls from some government building telling us what not to talk about. Uh, speaking of governments, uh, apparently the U.S. Justice Department has um, published. Well, this was I think last week. They published an indictment for two defendants. Uh, they're named as Eric. Megs and Declan Harrington, um, 20 and 21 years old. Wow, that's not a good age to be put in prison. Um, Basically, these two guys have been charged uh, with various um, crimes related to sin swapping because it turns out that they are some of the people that have been targeting uh, specifically. uh, They're actually called OG, um, social media account names in the indictment. Uh, They've been targeting people's phone numbers, um, cell phones specifically, in order to obtain their uh, cryptocurrency accounts and then take whatever coins they have. So there's, in the indictment, there's 11 counts. um, And the, if you want to read like a summary of, um, they're actually, they've been charged with conspiracy. So there's one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, eight counts of wire fraud, one count of computer fraud and abuse. And what are the rest? And one count of aggravated identity theft. So they got a lot of counts for wire fraud and then some other things. Um, but the they have a page uh, that says the manner and means of conspiracy. Um, and it basically describes all of the things they did in the course of targeting victims, um, breaking into their accounts, taking control of their phone numbers, and then stealing their cryptocurrency. Uh, So it says they identified potential victims who likely had significant amounts of cryptocurrency, um, for example, executives of cryptocurrency companies. They then researched the potential victims using online tools. They engaged in SIM swapping in order to take control of their cell phones. Um, They leveraged their control over those cell phones to obtain unauthorized access to the victim's online accounts, including email accounts, social media accounts, and cryptocurrency accounts. They then used those accounts um, to steal things of value in those accounts, including account handles, um, because there's a whole black market for particular account handles that um, are controlled by people and who do not want to give them up for various reasons. Um, as well as cryptocurrency, obviously. And then they were selling or otherwise transferring victims' login credentials, account handles, and cryptocurrency in exchange for money. So they were taking more than just cryptocurrency. And then they were using the victims' hacked online accounts to communicate with the victims' friends and family in order to ask for more money and cryptocurrency. Um, And they were then communicating with each other. So this was a coordinated effort. It wasn't just one person. And they were trying to hide their identities by using multiple online accounts. Um, So yeah, this does not surprise me at all um, because uh, a lot of people have been getting increasingly pissed off at the state of security when it comes to telecommunication systems, uh, especially cell phones, and how poor they are. And the consequence is that there's a lot of people holding cryptocurrency on devices that were not designed to do that. And so it's taken quite a long time actually for anyone to be prosecuted for this. Uh, it apparently says that they're going to get a, each defendant gets a maximum of uh, 20 years in prison if they are convicted on the charge of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and then aggravated identity theft carries a maximum of two years in prison. So, yep, that's that's happening. Wrecked. See, th- this is one of those uh, even a broken clock is right twice a day things. Uh, you know, say, say what you want about the Justice Department. Uh, 
good job on this one. Well, I'm not going to say good job because, on the other hand, they're also taking a lot of steps to prevent people from using devices that are truly secure. Um, we saw with the Apple versus FBI case that they're very much opposed to even you know consumers having encryption on their phones that they are not able to break. Because guess what, guys? If you can break it, that means other people can too. So I'm not going to give them too many pats on the back. In fact, I'm not going to give them any pats on the back um, because a lot of the reason why we aren't as secure yet in our telecommunication telecommunication systems and devices is because of their efforts to undermine that. So this is on them. America! Fuck yeah! Next. I'm guessing this is a mining topic. Ah, yep. This is really awesome. Uh, so, uh, actually, give me a second. Stupid JavaScript has re-enabled. Okay, so the second version of Stratum uh, is dropped out there. Pretty solid, uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, I'm going to try and dive through it as quick as I can, but is th this is... This is the, the, the mining side of, of the, the protocol stack here, uh, putting on their big boy pants. So the first thing they've done um, is pretty much um, broken up the, the mining protocol into three different types of communications. Um, a standard channel, an extended channel, and a group channel. And pretty much um, the, the idea is that standard channels um, are, are literally just passing work. Um, there is no manipulation of any kind of Merkle path or Coinbase data. Um, extended channels are, are kind of set up to allow more modularized control, um, search space, uh, subdivision, and so on. And group channels are just... Um, pretty much like a bundle of, of standard channels so that you can have them all going through the same communication line. And hopefully we'll start seeing why, uh, you know, that this setup like this is really awesome. So on the, on the low level here, they have replaced the, the JSON uh, structure that version one worked with into its own binary encoding. So pretty much there's a more than 50% bandwidth savings in all communications uh, because you don't have the extra overhead um, with a JSON file to be human readable. So that's a massive uh bandwidth savings right there in a mining pool farms operations like whatever part of, of the the system you're participating in like there's a massive bandwidth savings okay so another thing that's been done is kind of shifting the the way that data is passed around in terms of not recomputing merkle roots <clears throat> for different submissions so when, when you do a share and you send that back to the pool, they're, they're breaking up and modularizing the different pieces of block information that are going um, back and forth <clears throat> so that it can pretty much like think of it like, like a, a Merkle tree where you have all the, the hardware actually doing the mining at the bottom and passing data up to some proxy that passes it up to another proxy eventually gets to the pool. And you're, you're stripping out all the redundant information flowing up that communication channel because it's implicitly known. So somewhere up at the top, they can just get the information passed without that data and just fill it in themselves because they know what it is. And so this is, is a big efficiency gain in terms of the, the mining pools operations. Um, they're, they're saving a lot of, of computational cycles. Okay, now let's jump to the, the next uh, big change here. And I think this 
is really going to be interesting in terms of the only type of uh, way that I really see this making practical sense. So right now, the way things work, when you are mining a, a block and a new block is found, um, the pool makes a new empty block template, sends it to you, and you start mining that right away uh, because it's a lot quicker than sending a block template that's full. And you get started mining on the, the proper block as fast as possible. And the reason that is, is because the entire, um, you know, block template there referring to the last valid block is just a single message. And so they're in further modularizing things, breaking things up so that you can send a block template to miners for the, like, use this template after the next block is found. Um, separately with a blank previous block field and then if a new block is found you just send them the the previous block hash for them to fill in and they can immediately start mining on a, a block template that actually has transactions in it and the, the interesting thing here is really think about that what transactions can you confidently put in a a kind of like pre-made next block template like that that you can be sure are not in somebody else's block. Ones with low transaction fees. Because if somebody else finds the current block, then you pretty much um, like have them trying to get as, as much fee maximization as possible. So all the low end of the mempool is very high likelihood not going to be in the other miner's block. So you'll have block templates like stacked ahead for the next block with low fee stuff because it's at least something which is better than an empty block until you figure out like what the the previous miner used and and make a new more um, fee efficient in terms of your income block to start mining on. And so statistically, th this might wind up just kind of creating a guaranteed like, you know, statistical basis of very low fee stuff getting confirmed regularly just because of the, this little change here and how it makes sense for miners to optimize that. So I think that's going to be really interesting um, going forward. And that kind of deals with the entire um, you know, empty block mining incentive issue as well as this fringe benefit if i'm thinking this through right that you know every once in a while miners will actually mine a block with really low fee transactions because they just happen to find a block before they they change from that template so as well um there is man in the middle prevention so there's actually um encrypted uh, communications and anything that is not encrypted is cryptographically committed to for integrity so there's no longer the potential of hijacking um, or man in the middling miners and taking credit for their work in the with the the pool um, the job selection is um, a, a new feature which pretty much allows all the the aspects of better hash to be rolled into stratum version two. So there's now a job negotiation protocol, a job distribution protocol, and a template distribution protocol. And so pretty much a miner that wants to pick their own transactions can negotiate with the pool. And if they find that acceptable, start mining on that. And then that block also can be like split up and spread around and other people can use that if they want and you know now you have this dynamic where individual miners have the ability to select their own transactions baked into the stratum protocol now as well there's this the the header um only mining um which is kind of um the, that way for a, a mining uh or a piece of mining hardware to actually just like blindly take data and mine on it and not actually manipulate any data field itself beyond hashing. Um, there's multiplexing support so that you can have um, different uh, communication channels along the same physical communications. 
um, to split up uh, jobs among different like actual physical devices or split them up through proxies. So now um, the, the, the protocol directly supports really having the minimal amount of physical um, lines between a whole operation to actually efficiently get the work to the mining equipment and get the solved work back and, and out to the network. Um, <clears throat> there's also a little bit of overhead in kind of getting rid of negotiation of new connections. Um, the, the, a whole handshake in version one that was, um, yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm still here. I would like work, uh, to, to mine on that whole handshake has been removed and it's just implicitly assumed. Now, if you're connecting, um, you want work for mining. Um, native support for overt ASIC boost or version rolling is, is there now. And as well, taking advantage of the uh, multiplexing along physical connections, um, you, you can now do things uh, very efficiently in terms of switching where your mining equipment is um, in real time with no efficiency loss. So you could literally have two um, different block templates from two different mining pools being fed and spread around between your, your mining hardware in real time, like back and forth mining on both without any efficiency loss. And you can even take that, you know, it's, you might not like this, uh, to the extreme of switching back and forth between say Bitcoin and Bcash that quickly and efficiently in terms of uh you know your, your mining profitability and so like really the, the stratum like this like the, the new version of stratum version two is this is exactly what is needed to really push mining forward to really make this a massive like professional industry like this whole protocol is now streamlined for bandwidth efficiency, processing efficiency, modularity and efficiency in how you're moving data and splitting that data up between different um, devices controlling miners or different individual mining machines. Like this is literally been completely streamlined every way you can to just be capable of doing everything a real professional mining operation needs it to be so like this is fucking awesome i demand a comment from you and the kitty jimmy but i don't have any comment but cool mining protocol make everything grow mature why no excite why no excite I don't know. I'm not a miner. Uh, all right, then. We shall move along. So, next up... The fun stuff. Yes, the, the fun stuff. So, on uh, the last episode, we went through the malicious change output attack in Cold Card. Well, um... On the 15th, a worse version of this, um, also discovered uh, by a shift employee, was disclosed on the Trezor Model T. So pretty much uh, the TLDR of what happened here is if you take a transaction that's just a single signature um, input going to single signature outputs, and then add a multi-sig input that that doesn't have to be related to to the wallet um, you can add a multi-sig output that is not displayed or checked for on the the treasure screen as um something that that should be verified and showed to the user and so somebody able to intercept the transaction sent to the device could add this multi-sig input of their own and a multi-sig output sending your money to a one of two multi-sig where the attacker had one of the keys. So this, unlike the um, issue the cold card has, um, doesn't just 
remove the coins from your control and, and leave them held hostage, it literally puts them completely in the attacker's control. So if you have a Trezor Model T upgrade to firm, or firmware, what is it? 2.1.8, do not transact with the device until you update to that. But yeah, um, so the, this, is, uh, this is really bad. Um, come on, Janine. Uh, well, is this the point where we want to um, address the other thing that happened afterwards? I mean, it's kind of, yeah, kind of tangentially related. So um, pretty much, you know, I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit of the general environment uh, regarding the different hardware wallet companies over the past week or so since the uh, change output uh, ransom issue with the, the cold card was disclosed. Um, there has been a really, really strange just upsurge in, in sock puppets and anonymous accounts just shitting all over cold card, coin kite. Um, there, there was even somebody, pocket dev, uh, screaming about how they broke the security model of the Open Dime, uh, something numerous people have claimed over the years um, and never been able to put up a proof of concept um, in, in response to all of this. And it culminated in CoinKite's site getting DDoS'd. And so, like, I just kind of want to take a step back here for a second and just ask. Um, you know, what the hell is going on here? Because this is just really suspicious timing with the spate of vulnerability disclosures from Shift. With the, the entire, it, it just seems to me the entire way Shift has been trying to spin this is just PR grab, PR grab, PR grab. And this, this whole vulnerability issue is just a springboard into that. And, you know, like what, what's going on here? Because the, this just seems like shady as hell to me. Like there, there has always been instances of kind of shitting on coin kite stuff that seemed very sock puppety to me in the past. But this just takes the cake. Like this is like what's going on. Well, yeah, and I first I want to point out that um, as the person who actually disclosed the vulnerability said, uh, this vulnerability was not disclosed via Shift, actually. It was not work that was paid for by Shift or anything like that. Um, so first, I'm kind of annoyed that they're taking credit for uh, security research that they were not actually involved in. And as I am personally familiar with, uh, in general, they do not give a shit about um, at the leadership level at that company. So yeah, don't take credit for work that you not only don't actually care about outside of the PR points that you can win, but also don't take credit for things that you didn't pay for. Um, and I'm not, I don't know, I, after what I said a couple of days ago on social media, I'm not interested right now in waiting further into that because I individually can't do anything at the situation that would have an effect that I think is desirable in this situation. Um, but I am very annoyed if the social media battle is in any way connected to the DDoS stuff that's happening. That's really annoying. And if whoever's doing it, if they think that that's going to go unnoticed or people are not going to be suspicious about that and might not do something about that. Uh, we're watching and we're not going to let you get away with it. And it's definitely not going to make you look good. Oh, and I should also point out, um, isn't it so odd uh, that they are the first, as far as I'm aware of, they're the first hardware wallet company to be retiring an entire device and only giving a year in which they can promise that that device will even be functional because that seems like a very niche situation that i think would only be called for if you have discovered 
that the vulnerabilities in the device, the functioning of the device is so terrible that you you it would be a waste of time to try to improve it further. I just find it a very strange situation. Yep, Let, let's just say that the timing of that was uh, very weird. Because, you know, like I said, it's this, this whole thing was like the, the change output issue came out and then Shift did their PR spin. And then, you know, all this shitting and piling on cold card happened. And then whoosh quietly, like uh, quickly, oh, wait, we're retiring uh, the BitBox one year of support for version one, move on. And then like the, the DDoS, like all this shit. And now it's another interesting thing, you know, I, I'm waiting to see is how, how, how bad is the blowback against Trezor? Because really, like what just happened here is like a worse version of the change output issue on the cold card but how is the the public reaction going to be different from from the one to the cold card like all the this piling on this what looks to me like sock puppeting and just narrative propagation like how is that you know is that the same thing going to happen to trezor or is is it going to be a completely different reaction for the worse exploit because it's trezor yeah, I'm just I'm just so tired of all this back and forth and sniping and like I get it. It's a competitive industry and you have an incentive to make your competitors look bad. I get it, but it's like to then like there was this claim like you didn't participate in the coordinated disclosure blah 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 and it's like but none of you are very good at participating in coordinated disclosures because you have a very hard time getting along with each other. So like, that's just the weirdest of the accusations that I've seen. It's like, yeah, do a coordinated disclosure when you can't even coordinate on things together because you hate each other. Yeah. And see, another thing is like Rodolfo is, is saying that at the time they like explained and disclosed the shit, um, like, cause remember that it was like the, the cold card firmware patching, it came out and then shift came out with, no, 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 this vulnerability. And then cold card wrote their response to it at the time they came out with it. Um, the last communication with Rodolfo was like, keep it quiet for now, uh, while we tinker with other devices. And then after he releases the patch, they just come out and like, whoa, 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 this vulnerability. So like that right there is that's that that's like professional politician level like manipulation shit there. But we, perhaps we should move on to things that are maybe less infuriating. I'm not sure. Do I have to check? Yes, it is less infuriating. Yep. See that that sound? Hear that? Hear that? I'm gonna explain that sound after I tell a tale of how Shinobi is a complete fucking idiot. So we begin this tale two years ago when I started thinking about what if you could make multi-sig wallets with an open dime? And I ran into the limitation, it only exposes the private key. And for two years, Shinobi has read and yelled and badgered Rodolfo Novak in private to give me an open dime that exposed the public key directly. So, in the meantime, uh, somebody in Japan uh, running a, a small, uh, you know, nice looking operation called Trustless Inc. Um, just dropped a tool yesterday out of nowhere that pulls the public key for an open dime off the open dime because get this. Here's where Shinobi's a complete retard. Each open dime signs a random 20 byte nonce when you stick it into a computer to prove it has the private key. And the way that verifying a message signature works is you take the signature and the address and mathematically from that can derive the actual public key, which you need to do multi-sig stuff. So the entire two years I've been yelling at Rodolfo to give me an open dime I can get the public key off of. Um, all open dimes that have ever existed um, have, have been possible to get 
the public key off of. So this is a two of three multi-sig where all of the keys are open dimes. Trustless Inc., you are the fucking shit. I am a fucking idiot. Come on, Gene, why aren't you excited? Isn't this cool? I can just fly to you with these and hand you one of these and you're in the multi-sig now. And then you can just hand that to somebody else and you're not in the multi-sig and they are in the multi-sig now. It's a thing you can do now. Yeah, that's really awesome. Are we going to do that? Are you going to fly here? Uh, Bitcoin moon. When Bitcoin moon. Oh, come on. Why is your travel dictated by charts and candles? Because I am what is known as a cheap ass. Yeah. Alrighty then. This is uh, this is badass, uh, and there are going to be amazing things that come out of this. You mark my words, amazing things. Onward! Psst, that's you, Janine. I know, I was waiting for the transition. So, um, in the last episode, we covered briefly the discussion that was going on uh, about why Wire Messenger has moved its holding company to the United States and why they hadn't notified people more visibly that they were going to do this. Um, within a day, I think the next day after that episode, we, um, or at least I did see that Wire addressed the issue and... Um, to give a background, as I said, they had received investment earlier in the year, particularly from Morpheus Ventures. And according to CEO Morton Brogger in an interview, uh, he said, we, we knew we needed this funding and additional support um, to support continued growth. We made the decision that at some point in time, it would be easier to get funding in North America where there's six times the amount of venture capital. Um, and then the key part in the response in the interview that he gave is that while the holding company is now in the U.S., everything else will apparently remain um, the same as it was before. So the licensing remains in Switzerland. The software development team is mostly based in Berlin and the hosting um, of data will remain in Europe as it has been. So regarding... I mean, that was the biggest issue is like I was wondering what else was going to change besides the legal status um, and registration of the holding company and whether that had implications elsewhere. Um, so that's covered. Uh, then regarding the question of why they didn't inform their users better about this change, Brogger said that, quote, there was no change in control and the move is very tactical because of fundraising. Our evaluation was that this was not this at being informing users was not necessary. Was it right or wrong? I don't know. We are in Switzerland, which has the best privacy laws in the world and wire now belongs to the, to a new holding group, but there is no change in control. Uh, end quote. So despite the fact that uh, I don't think it was the best decision to not inform people because you are dealing with a crowd that is more sensitive to such changes, especially when they, you know, have to go digging for them and then they don't get a response from you promptly about why this was not highlighted somewhere. Um, I think they should have been as open with people as possible, even if it wasn't strictly required in their um, terms of service or privacy policy. But in general, I'm not, at least as far as I can see, I'm not too concerned, too concerned about this change because um, I do think that there's some legal risks that they might encounter by moving the holding company into the U.S. Um, but what I'm most concerned about and what I think a lot of people are most concerned about is that the development is not being moved and the data storage is supposedly not being moved. So as long as those two things remain the same, the corporate jurisdiction shifting is not as alarming in my view. Um, at least I don't see it as something to be alarmed at right now. Uh, but that may change. I don't know. Nope, never use a wire again. There is clearly some kind of lizard person conspiracy going on here. I don't buy a word. Yes, and that lizard person is named Money. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's that makes sense. You know, it's all kinds of stupid red tape for nonsense. Although, I, I wouldn't say that 
like I would still say there's some concern regardless of the fact that the actual physical storage site isn't changing because like how what trees exist between Switzerland and the US regarding you know jurisdiction based on corporate owner like are are is there some kind of treaty guaranteeing like compliance with Switzerland of you know legal demands from the US because the owner is in the US like I'd, like what's the the kind of situation there because that's something I think could still be a factor yeah i mean i i would have to look into what the risks are i mean in general i just think it's better to keep everything outside of the us so i don't know whether they evaluated those concerns and weighed them against the potential venture capital that they think they're going to find um but then again if they think that they can't be the most effective without getting that venture capital or they think they can be better by getting it then maybe that's a good thing and that in the end maybe they'll move back in the future i don't know this might be temporary um and also keep in mind it's the holding company it's not wire directly or the staff directly so like i said i'm most concerned about where the development is based and where the data is stored. That's the primary concern. Obviously, I think the legal risk is present. I just don't know how worried I would be in terms of like, I'm not going to start telling people not to use it anymore or something. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I generally try not to make recommendations for any of this stuff beyond like, I use this. Like, it's it's all way to the risk because there there's a lot of factors that really come into play depending on what your threat model is and what you want your communications to be safe from. And also like, so there's obviously alternatives, but not all of them are as user-friendly as wire. So what are the other user-friendly alternatives that don't have this trade-off? Signal, oh wait, Signal is based in the US. Keybase, oh, Keybase is based in the US. WhatsApp. Oh, WhatsApp is, you know, Facebook. Um, what else? Jabber. Like hmm? conversations Jabber. Yeah. That <laughs> there's also Jabber, which I use Jabber, but um yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's not I don't I wouldn't say it's quite as easy to set up for the average person as the other ones. So I out of out of the options that it's like a encrypted communications app that's relatively easy for anyone to use. I don't see anything that's better than wire at the moment, especially if you're like me and don't want to use a phone. That cuts out Telegram, that cuts out Signal, that cuts out WhatsApp. So, yeah. I don't I don't see any other better options unless you want to go to the a bit less user-friendly options and stuff that most a lot like a lot less people use. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, so shall we move along? Yep. So Tether has filed um, pretty much a heads up to the judge that they are going to be uh, making a motion to dismiss the insane class action lawsuit against them for trillions of dollars in damages. Um, And it's actually... I think very highly likely that this is going to get granted. Um, Really a big core part of their uh, argument is that the study, uh, the the Griffin report that was cited (laughs) regarding tether manipulation um, actually has been amended. And um, I also, I should clarify, it's never actually officially been published. There are just drafts that are public. So the most recent public draft has been amended um, and, and, and like walking back the claim of printing money out of thin air to there was a single big tether customer. Um, so like a big core piece of that is falling apart. And as well, just under the different antitrust, uh, the RICO charge, uh, the common law fraud claim, 
Um, they're, they're just eviscerating all of these claims and pointing out one um, in the antitrust, no definition of a monopoly in, in the legal sense exists, that, that in the RICO case, no kind of collusion or racketeering coordination was present. Um, the common law fraud case, that there was no material misrepresentations. Um, in in a, a claim under uh, GBL section 349, um, it's it's pretty much a consumer fraud um, thing. It's there is no consumer oriented practice that was misleading in a material way. And then in every one of these charge challenges, there is the fact that the complainants cannot actually show a material causal connection between any action of the defendants and a specific demonstrable material loss experienced by them. So I, I, I think this is very, very high likelihood that this, uh, <laughs> this crazy lawsuit is, is going to be off to the wayside soon. Cricket. So has Tether been kicked in the nether or is Tether kicking some nethers? No, I, did, I think that this lawsuit's going to wind up getting thrown out and then what's left on their plate is pretty much the situation with the Attorney General's office. But on that note, I want to move along to some other shitty legal proceedings. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily shitty because it's like one less annoyance that some lawyers have to deal with. But um, if you guys haven't heard, uh, maybe because I've, I haven't really had time to make a comment because it's so strange and infuriating. But yesterday was a big day uh, for Assange because the Swedish Prosecution Authority, or should I say the Deputy Director of Public Prosecution, decided to hold a press conference to report developments in that case. And a lot of people assumed that this press conference would be to announce charges, uh, which they, I don't know why you would assume that, because they have not done that over the past 10 years that this whole ordeal has been going on. Uh, but anyway, that assumption turned out to be embarrassingly wrong because it turns out that they have actually decided to close the preliminary investigation for the third time. This is the third time that the investigation has been opened and closed. We have now, I think we're on our, with this, in this uh, reopening, we were on our fourth prosecutor. It's like amazing. So the first link in the description is to the English language copy of the announcement from the Deputy Director of Public Prosecution, who's um, Eva Pearson. And it says that uh, they have today decided to discontinue the investigation regarding Julian Assange. The reason for this decision is that the evidence has weakened considerably due to the long period of time that has elapsed since the events in question. Um, and the reason this is infuri infuriating to me is because even as they are closing this investigation for the third and hopefully final time, they are still trying to promote this narrative that it is Assange's fault that the investigation can't continue. When, if you actually listen to the press conference, um, it takes a while to start. Um, I believe it's at the, it's either at the second or third uh, link under this story that I give. Um, but if you actually listen to the press conference, towards the end of it, um, she can't even hold the narrative together for 10 minutes straight because at one point she says that they decided to close the investigation once they realized that any further interviews with, with Assange would not be effective in, you know, changing the evidentiary status of the case. As in, interviewing him would be pointless even though they went to the Uppsala court the court rejected their uh, request to, I can't remember exactly what it was, I think it was just a request for uh, detention in absentia. Um, the, the Uppsala court rejected that, so they couldn't do that. Um, but for her to say that, you know, interviewing him would be pointless, it's like, then how can you claim that the, the reason that the investigation is closing is because you know, time has run out and it's his fault. Like, that's what they've been saying this whole time, is that time has run out and it's his fault. And that's something that's been disputed over and over and over again. 
uh, over this over the course of the last decade that this case has been going on. Because at one point, uh, I can't remember if it was 2011 or 2012, but there are email records between the Swedish prosecution and the CPS, the Crown Prose- Prosecution Service in the UK. And Sweden at that point was saying, we are going to close this investigation. And the UK was telling them, don't close it. So already back in 2011, 2012, they were thinking of closing this investigation and they were being told not to. Also, again, there is a mutual legal assistance uh, treaty between the UK and Sweden. It is normal procedure, as they have followed in other cases, for Sweden to make a request to interview someone remotely using this thing called video conferencing. I don't know if you've heard of it, Sweden, but you're able to interview a person, a suspect, whatever, remotely, and that's fine. You can also, you know, visit them in the country where they're currently stuck, whether imprisoned or under house arrest or whatever. If they're agreeing to meet with you, especially, you can go meet them in that country and you can interview them there. They did that in, I believe, 2015? 2015, 2016. Uh, Actually, it might have been all the way in 2017. I can't remember. But at one point, the Swedish... um, because this, like, so many years have passed. But at one point, they did actually come and interview him in the Ecuadorian embassy, and they left, and then the investigation was closed. And it's like, I don't get it. Anyway, um, also, I don't understand, like, for them to say too much time has passed. Well, I don't, like, didn't too much time pass in May? Like, why did you reopen the investigation in May if you think that November is too much time, but May is not? Like, what changed? I don't see how a span of a few months makes a big difference other than to use the reopening of the investigation strategically in some political way to make him look bad and pretend that this is about Sweden and not about the U.S. extradition case. And so... According to Pearson, the only things that they've managed to achieve in the last couple of months since they reopened it is that they again communicated with the injured party who apparently gave a statement um, or something, and they also interviewed one or more new witnesses. And apparently that was not substantial enough to move the case forward in itself, and apparently they don't think that interviewing Assange is substantial enough to even attempt it anymore. Um, one of the other things that came up is that in the statement provided by the, um, by the deputy director, at one point, I don't know if it's directly in the statement, but in the statement she made in the press conference, she said that the statement that they got, or the account that they got from the, in, quote, injured party, um, was credible. Now, people keep reading that as, you know, that mean that that proves that whatever her the allegation is that proves that it was correct um or that they have evidence to prove that it was correct that's not necessarily the case and also that doesn't mean that there's that doesn't that's the implication is that you know there's criminal charges that could be filed on that basis and that's not the case either because actually since the two women were first interviewed back At the start of this case, the first prosecutor to, um, actually no, the second prosecutor to be involved who ended up closing the investigation the first time, the preliminary investigation, also said that the statement by the quote injured party was credible, but that what the injured party disclosed did not contain any criminal conduct that was worth then charging Assange with. So saying a person's statement is credible is not the same thing as saying this this therefore warrants making charges. So yeah, there's just like, it's just so annoying this, that this investigation can be opened and closed, opened and closed so many times that this really bad narrative is still being promoted because like, if there was any justice here, all of these prosecutors, including this last one, should be investigated for, you know, basically not following procedure um, in terms of proportionality, which is what happened with the last prosecutor. She was investigated and actually told by a court in in Sweden um, that her actions did not constitute um, 
a respect for proportionality, and that contributed to the investigation getting closed last time. So, yeah, that's a, that was a big update, but there's a lot to be said about this, what was intended to be a small press conference. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear at this point that they're just, like, juggling as many pieces that they can keep moving at one time to fuck with him as possible. And it's just a, a game of attrition at this point, I think, and until they just decide, like they did last time while he was in the embassy, okay, we're done playing. All right, all right. Are we ready to move on to another infuriating government entity? We So, Bloomberg Law reportedly talked to a senior IRS official who has expressed a very high uh, degree of focus and interest on cryptocurrency kiosks and ATMs. He's quoted um, as saying, if, if you can walk in, put cash in, and get Bitcoin out, obviously we are interested potentially in the person using the kiosk and what the source of the funds are, but also in the operators of the kiosk. So they, they are expecting... Um, you know, massive increases in the amount of ATMs around and are starting to shift focus and concentrate on, on things like this and exchanges, whether they're based in the U.S. or not, um, that could lead to tax avoidance uh, regarding cryptocurrencies. So it seems to me like they're very much shifting and gearing up to concentrate on cracking down specifically on crypto-based tax avoidance. Surprise, surprise. Well, I mean, it's it was always the most obvious ratchet to like keep tightening up. Like they they already have very idiotic precedents for how to deal with Bitcoin and other things as far as taxes go. So just keep getting more idiotic and keep ratcheting up the the enforcement and the, the scrutiny of anybody they know who has crypto. Like things went way too far to just outright ban it. So. Now all they can do is just make it an obnoxious headache to deal with. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's kind of funny because the more that you make people feel anxiety about using Bitcoin, I mean, some people are still going to just use it regardless, and pe you know, people are going to dox themselves to exchanges and keep trading. But a large portion of people are just going to be like, well, screw it. If you're going to make this so difficult for me, I'm just going to sit here and hold it and do nothing with it. And that, you know, holding is not a taxable event. So just going to sit here on my bags forever until you're irrelevant. And then like they're, they're basically just, they're, they're incentivizing people to just go into a hodl position and not change that for a long time. Or just trying to shift things to the point where they can start working on changing public opinion and making this look like something that's no good, that, that that's you, you shouldn't have anything to do with. Yeah, but I mean, there's now so many people involved and they can they can see, especially with countries that are suffering from hyperinflation and capital controls and everything... I mean, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of idiots, especially in countries where they don't yet have those problems and don't have to worry about them yet and aren't poor. If you're not one of those people, you're going to see the effect that this stuff has and how it's helping people, and you're not going to believe in the bullshit propaganda that these people put out for much longer. I mean, we'll see. I, I think there's a tendency historically to always... I don't know, over and underestimate things. All right, though, I guess just move along and do a quick update. Uh, my last thing for the day. Uh, Fidelity uh, Digital Asset Services has been granted a limited liability trust company charter by uh, Department of Financial Services in New York. 
So they are now a licensed, approved uh, custodian and trading platform for institutional investors. And, you know, this is kind of, I think, the, the rock and the hard place to kind of tie back to the IRS thing a little bit is, you know, a lot of institutions really want to ratchet things up and cause a headache and try to shift the, the whole perception in a negative direction. But it's really hard to do that. When you have companies like Fidelity building out and getting approval for, you know, cryptocurrency platforms like this. So it's like, it's kind of a tug of war there. And it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Right, and I guess that's uh, you with the last thing, Jimmy. Yeah, so I know it's been a long time since uh, Delete Coinbase happened. That was all the way back in February and March. Um, but there was still one last thing that I've been wanting to do for a while, uh, which is that one of the, I can't remember if it was three or four, but there's three or four articles um, about that in and the developments in Bitcoin Magazine. And one of them concerned the acquisition um, figures and date uh, for the um, the Neutrino Coinbase acquisition, as in Coinbase acquiring Neutrino um, from the founders, and also acquiring them until apparently they didn't, although never got a confirmation on that. Uh, that was very clear, but anyway, I've been wanting to publish that acquisition agreement, which is fully possible for anyone to do because um, it's not a strictly private document. It's something that, uh, let's say, tax attorneys or whatever, it's, it's, a, it's a corporate document that a lot of parties can access. And um, so when the Bitcoin Magazine article about those figures was published, um, I mean, like a lot of media outlets, they're not generally in the habit of publishing the primary sources because why? Like, I mean, there are people like me who really care and would prefer to have primary source documents, uh, but j they're just not in the habit of doing that. Um, but yeah, I think the primary source should be public. And so a few days ago, I published the original Italian language um, acquisition agreement uh, via my website and I tweeted it out. So if you want to read it and see the terms and the people involved and how they saw each other and what they were, you know, willing to give each other and everything. You can now read that or at least translate it from Italian. Here, here for primary sources. So I guess on that note, that's uh, final thought time. What you got today, Jimmy? Oh boy, final thoughts. Uh, you might have to go first. I need to think of something. But, but. But what if I can't go first because I wanted to make a silly ending joke? Okay, so my final thought is just me reading off a uh, tweet from Malware Tech. Um, if you remember, we've talked about his case before. But uh, he tweeted on November 17th that cryptocurrency exchange KYC is the TSA of finance. My exchange just requested I explain to them where I've been sending my Bitcoin and why. Not sure if I signed up for a cryptocurrency exchange or possessive spouse simulator 2019, which I thought was pretty funny. Hmm. Interesting. And he then uh, commented below that. He said, I can't remember if fucking with KYC forms is illegal or I just explain all my payments as, quote, probably not drugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the exchange is Bitfinex, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh priceless oh. i don't know i don't i don't actually know myself whether screwing with kyc forms i mean i think at some point it might be if you if they're doing it under specific regulations that require that and i don't know if you doing it would be illegal but they would get in trouble if they were found to have collected and not properly verified a customer uh but definitely you will get some uh, knocks on the door if you fill in the form saying probably not drugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So my final thought is motherfuckers, 
Open dimes. Public keys. Start playing with them. Here's a crazy idea. You know what you can do with an open dime? You can take all the public keys on three of them and, and add those into a single public key and then encrypt data to it where you need all three private keys to add up to get the matching key to decrypt it. I think that's what we're going to do for the, the 200th episode of Block Digest. We're going to release it encrypted and you got to get the open dimes to watch it. So see ya or not for episode 200 next time. Later, punks. Oh my god, like it's hard enough getting people to join us on Mumble. How do you expect them to be able to decrypt the episode? That's the joke. They gotta find me in real life. Ha ha! Peace. <laughs> yep, bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah.